يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا ملك يا قوي أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وصلوات الله وتسليماته على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Dear brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another year with the Quran Inshallah this year we'll be studying Surah Al-Kahf which is the 18th Surah of the Quran and to start off, firstly, I'd just like to say um, thank you to the Islamic Society for organizing this. And I also very, uh, feel very grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and very honored that he's um, allowed me to gather with you once again to take um, yet another journey and to contemplate and to reflect upon and to meditate on the Qur'an. Uh, it's uh, purely a favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he didn't have to give this favor. Before I introduce Surah Al-Kahf, the uh, surah that we'll be studying uh, this year, I'd like to just mention a few things about the Quran, just a bit of an introduction. And the first thing is, the first point is that each and every journey through the Quran is a new world. It's a journey full of treasures, full of precious gems and teachings waiting to be discovered. It's a world in which we find uh, signposts and guidances to help us to find our way in the path of life. And it's also a world of profound emotions that will melt your heart. Each surah, each chapter, of the Quran is an eternal spring. Those who, those who taste its sweet waters feel a serenity and a peace and a, vitali a vitality and a purification that no other water can bring. Now this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Al-Isra قُلْ آمِنُوا بِهِ أَوْ لَا تُؤْمِنُوا إِنَّ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ إِذَا يُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ يَخِرُّوا لِلْأَذْقَانِ سُجَّدًا وَيَقُولُونَ سُبْحَانَ رَبِّنَا إِنْ كَانَ وَعْدُ رَبِّنَا لَمَفْعُولًا وَيَخِرُّونَ لِلْأَذْقَانِ يَبْكُونَ وَيَزِيدُهُمْ خُشُوعًا The Qur'an says, say, whether you believe in the Qur'an or not, indeed those who were given knowledge beforehand, when it's recited to them, they fall down on their faces in prostration saying, Glory to you, our Lord. Truly has the promise of our Lord been fulfilled. And they fall down in their, on their faces in tears. And it increases them in humility. So this is the first point. The second point is that these, if you imagine with me, these are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unchanged since they came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking to you and to me. Just as Allah spoke to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the night journey, on the Isra from uh, Mecca to the furthest mosque in uh, Jerusalem. And then when he ascended to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa in the sacred valley of Tuwa in Sinai, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to you and to me, Come to me, O slaves, and listen. Come to me, O my slaves. And so this is a gift that so few take. A gift and a blessing and a favor that so few people appreciate when they're alive and so many appreciate at the end of their lives. This is an act of mercy which is enough to overwhelm you and to inspire you to yearn to enter and strive to enter the world of the Qur'an. Its message is so powerful and weighty that the Qur'an says that if لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله 
that if we were to reveal this Quran upon a mountain, ala jabalin, la ra'aytahu khashi'a, you would have seen this mountain humble, mutasaddi'an min khashiyatillah, crumbling to dust out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the power, this is the gravity and the significance and the weight of this message. And it's interesting that although that would happen, although that would happen to a mountain, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to reveal this message upon you and me, upon the human being. Point number three is all of us want to be better people. All of us want to be successful and to improve ourselves. And there is nothing more effective in changing people, in changing us and trans transforming us and healing us than the Qur'an. This is why the Qur'an says, Ya ayyuhan nas, O mankind, Qad ja'atkum maw'idhatum min rabbikum wa shifa'un lima fi sudur wa hudan wa rahmatun lil mu'minin. The Quran says, O mankind, there has come to you a maw'idha, an exhortation, a reminder from your Lord and a healing for the diseases in your hearts. A healing, wa shifa'un lima fi sudur. And for those who believe, a guidance and a mercy. My dear brothers and sisters, there was a man who wholeheartedly and completely submitted to the Quran and allowed it to shape him 100%. Who was that man? That man was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when Aisha was asked about the manner, about the character, about the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how he used to deal with people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his behavior, the Aisha, his wife, she said, Kana khuluquhu al-Qur'an. She said that his khuluq, his way, his behavior, who he was, was the Qur'an. So it was as if the Prophet wasallam, because the Qur'an was revealed to him, because he received the Qur'an, and because he understood what the Qur'an was, and because he imbibed the Qur'an, that he became the message of the Qur'an. And this is the message of this um, halqa. This is the message of this study circle, of these study sessions, that we, inshallah, by the permission of Allah, by the will of Allah, we're going to try and understand the meanings of the Qur'an and to take that journey through the Qur'an hand in hand and to study and to contemplate and then to try and allow our hearts and allow our souls and our minds to be coloured by the Qur'an so that we can become like the Prophets. Just imagine nine months in the womb of your mother transformed you from a drop of water into you hearing and seeing and thinking can you imagine what a lifetime with the quran seeking thinking striving interacting can do for you it can make you into an entirely new being before he, whom even the angels are proud to kneel so the more you open your heart to the quran the more we open our lives to this beautiful message which is unparalleled and unique which Marmaduke picked for one of the translators of the Quran called the inimitable symphony the um, uncopyable symphony if you like the greater you become in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that it would be said to the person the possessor of the Quran the friend of the Quran the companion of the Quran it will be said to that person, read and rise and keep on rising and recite as you used to recite in the dunya. For indeed, your station will stop where, at where the last of your recitation stops, stopped. So where you, so keep on reciting as much as you recite it. This will be in the next life. This will be in paradise. Keep on reciting. Keep on reading and rise with your recitation. Rise with your, so just as the Quran raises us, as it raised the prophets and the messengers who received the revelation of the Quran and of previous revelations, 
Just as we rise in this world with the revelation of the Quran, so in the next life, we will rise as we rose in this life. Number four, I want to say that these were gathered here now, mashallah, a good number of people, brothers and sisters. I want to say that these are very precious moments. And I really believe that you'll remember these moments and you'll smile back upon them. So many people spend their lives and their youth in lesser pastimes, in frivolities and um, whims and things which have no, no kind of impact on them and on other people and on their later lives. And they have nothing which, uh, to really show for later on. And I ask you a question, is there really anything more precious, more worthy, anything more deserving to be considered an achievement than studying a surah of the Qur'an? Is there anything more deserving to be considered an ambition, an, a, an achievement than studying a part of the Qur'an, part of the kalam, part of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That book which is the key to the guidance of Allah and therefore the key and therefore the key to what all of us here are searching for for true happiness for true and real success which is everlasting and which never ends قُلْ بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ فَبِذَلِكَ فَالْيَفْرَحُ هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ The Quran says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this bounty of Allah and in his mercy, meaning the Qur'an, in this bounty of Allah, in that let them rejoice. فَلْيَفْرَحُ Let them be happy. Let them rejoice. Let them be ecstatic. Let them rejoice. That is better than the wealth that they hold and amass. Brothers and sisters, the Qur'an, having said this, the Qur'an opens its doors only to those who knock with a depth of sincerity and purpose. To gather the treasures of the Qur'an, you have to be prepared to abandon yourself completely to its guidance. Okay, inshallah. How tragic would it be if you came to the Qur'an and went away empty-handed? So I, do, I want to, inshallah, mention uh, after the break, we'll have a break now, and I want to mention three prerequisites and three conditions that we all need before we can benefit from the Qur'an. Three things that we all need to take into account when we're coming to the Qur'an, when we're reading the Qur'an and we're understanding the Qur'an. Inshallah, I'll mention these after the break. Inshallah. So we'll get ready now and we'll do our wudu and we'll uh, uh, recite Maghrib, um, pray Maghrib prayer. Zakallah. Okay, very quickly, because we don't have time, uh, we're going to be um, finishing at uh, 6.30, so we've only got 15 minutes. Um, um, the three prerequisites that I wanted to mention for benefiting from the Qur'an is, number one, that we allow the Qur'an to change us. Um, so that requires opening our minds and our hearts to what it's teaching and saying. Um, so it's very important to clear our minds from any previous ideas or philosophies or notions or beliefs. This is an extremely, extremely important point. This is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was ummi. He was, illit he was unlettered. Um, um, and the importance of that, and this is perhaps one of the um, benefits and one of the wisdoms it was given to the Arabs, was that they had not yet really been affected by as were maybe the Persians at the time and the Romans at the time by elaborate philosophies. So they were almost a, uh, uh, a clean slate for the Qur'an to come into mold. So this is really, really important as people who've grown up in the modern world, people who've interacted and, um, you know, uh, engaged and, and been probably influenced by the media, all sorts of values, all sorts of ideas, all sorts of norms, all sorts of cultures, um, you know, so we're a mix of things. Right? So um, this, is, this is an important attitude to have with the Qur'an, that the Qur'an um, basically allow the Qur'an to color you and to inform you and to reconstitute your ideas and to guide you. Uh, so let the Qur'an take you by the hand and lead you to where it wants to take you. Don't worry, it knows where it's going. 
So let it take you to where it wants to take you. And this is really, really important. This needs submission. It needs surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It needs sincerity. This is point number one. Number two is study and contemplation. The Quran time and time, and time again encourages us to think uh, uh, and to reflect upon its verses. The Quran says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Do they not ponder over the Quran or are there locks over their hearts? So the Quran poses this question. Don't you think, don't you ponder, don't you, don't you analyze, don't you meditate the verses? أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Or are there locks on their hearts? So, um, for um, for us to be people of reflection, we need to remove these locks. And those people who don't reflect, it's as if they have locks on their hearts. So we don't want to be people whose hearts have become corroded. Because that lock is a lock of corrosion. Because the Prophet wasallam said that these hearts, uh, that these hearts corrode and they become rusty, like iron becomes rusty. So these hearts, they, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he um, he uh, compared them to, to metal and to and to iron, and 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 the and the washing away of the iron is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa taala, of which the greatest is the Quran. So this is very very. So the Quran needs time, it needs thought, it needs hard work. You know, the Quran isn't come, it's not going to come and chase you, right? The Quran is not going to do that. You have to go and chase the Quran. You have to go and. Um, want to receive the Quran um, so it has to become a central feature of your life not just a, a, a kind of a sideshow that gets relegated to the bottom of the to-do list um, if it's on the to-do list uh, at all right? um, but if you do if we do this brothers and sisters if we have this intention that we have this um, um, we have this um, kind of uh, uh, attitude then the possibilities are endless and the adventure is, is exciting and you're no longer the same person. You, you, and you have, what you have is the secret of the prophets. This was their secret. It's nothing amazingly mysterious and mystical, right? Because this, this religion is not a mi- religion of mystery and, and mysticism, as some people claim, of secrecy, right? This religion, religion is a very open religion. It's a very rational religion. It's a religion for anybody to question, right? And it's a religion for anybody to to, to ask questions of just um, you know um, can, just, can I just switch that okay just put it here it's just vibrating the whole table um, and this is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said da'a hadu hadha al-Quran fa wal-ladhi nafsi biyadihi lahu wa ashaddu tafassiyan min al-ibili min uquliha he said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said have a continuous relationship with this Qur'an. Ta'ahadu had al Qur'an. Stay close to this Qur'an. By the one who has the life of Muhammad in his hands, meaning by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is quicker to escape than camels escape from their, um, from their reins. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in a hadith which is authentic, which has been narrated in the Sahih of Bukhari, he said, um, um, have a relationship with the Qur'an, have a continuous relationship with the Qur'an. And often people use this hadith to meet, to refer to hifaz, to refer to memorizing the Qur'an, but it doesn't mean that. This hadith doesn't, isn't talking about the memorization of the Qur'an, and those who then memorize it and don't, don't practice and revise a lot will then lose their memorization. It doesn't, it's not talking about, it's talking about the Quran affecting you and your ideas and your judgments and your decisions. That's what the that's what this hadith is talking about. The Quran, this hadith is saying that if you don't have a continuous daily relationship with the meanings of the Quran, then what will end up happening is that the decisions that you take in life and the way you see life and the way you see others and the way you deal with people and the way you walk in life will not be according to the Quran. So you will not be like the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is actually what this, and this is really, really important. That if you don't continuously interact with this Quran, the Quran escapes. So the Quran leaves. So it's very, very important to have a continuous relationship. And inshallah, alhamdulillah, this um, circle is um, part of the reason, or, part, uh, or partly a way 
for us to achieve that. The third and final point I want to mention is that um, to be aware that once you embark upon this journey, your potential becomes so great that Satan, Shaytan, will make huge efforts to deprive you of the fruits of your labor. When you come to the Qur'an, when you have your intention to be with the Qur'an, and that you make a plan to be with the Qur'an, what you notice suddenly is that there's huge obstacles in your way. He might pollute your intention, intention. he might distract you. You know, really try it. You know, you're, you're trying to study the Qur'an and suddenly all, all sorts of ideas come to your mind. You know, you want to, you wanna, oh yeah, you remember there's a text message that you need to reply to or a Facebook message that you need to get back to us. Something that you need to do suddenly somehow, you know, every few minutes this happens. You know, just try even just memorize the Qur'an and you'll suddenly, you know, um, have all these thoughts. So he'll try to weaken your resolve. He'll try to weaken your commitment or to tempt you. So be conscious of this. That when you start on anything good, the obstacles will come your way. And so with this in mind, you should say, or, and we should say, A'udhu Billah. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaytan Ar-Rajeem. Na'udhu Billahi Minash Shaytan Ar-Rajeem. We seek refuge in Allah from Shaytan, the accursed one. And this is why the Quran says, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ If you read the Quran, when you read the Quran, فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Then seek refuge in Allah, seek sanctuary in Allah from Satan, the accursed one. Okay, so I wanted to mention these three points. Um, let's move on to the, um, to the surah. Like I said, Surah Al-Kahf is the 18th surah or the, chap- or the 18th chapter of the Qur'an. This is the chapter of the cave. And the word cave actually probably comes from the word Kahf. You know, you can, uh, it's quite similar. The two words are quite similar. As many, many words in, um, you know, there are many words in English that you'll come across and Western languages generally that come from Arabic because of the confluence of the two civilizations historically. Um, as you know, the Quran is made of uh, chapters or surahs, 114 of them. Surah Kahf is the 18th chapter, coming immediately after Surah Al Isra and coming immediately before Surah Maryam. There's another division of the Quran, uh, which is not chapters and surahs, but which is ajza. Uh, so the Quran is also divided into 30 equal parts of 20 pages each and there are 30 of these parts uh, in the Quran in Arabic you say juz in Urdu you say or, or in Persian you say spara um, Surat Kahf spans the last half of the 15th juz and the first um, part of the 16th juz or the 16th part of the Quran therefore Surat Kahf is right in the middle is bang in the middle of the Quran so these are the surahs and the ajza of the Qur'an. Also, each surah in the Qur'an, each chapter in the Qur'an is made up of verses and of ayat. Uh, surah Al-Kahf has 110 verses. The other thing is that um, we know that the Qur'an was revealed over a period of 23 years. 13 of the, those years were in Mecca and 10 of those years were in Medina. And the wisdom behind this was that the Qur'an was a living book. It was a book that came, that um, uh, basically responded to events and issues and problems as they arose. It reacted to people's everyday occurrences. So when an occurrence happened, when a battle happened, for example, the Battle of Badr, the verses came down about the, about the Battle of Badr. Um, if uh, the Prophet ﷺ migrates, there are verses around to do with that. If Aisha is accused, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, of, of, um, of, of being unfaithful to her husband, then the verses of slander come down and prohibit, and so on and so forth. So the book is a living, breathing entity, um, um, training and molding and raising and nurturing people over 23 years, which is why... Uh, it was so powerful in changing these people. And this is why actually the companions, what they said is that we used to 
learn and memorize 10 verses at a time and it's only only when we understood those verses and only when we imbibed and imbued those verses and only when we acted upon those verses that we then used to move on to the next 10 verses because they understood quality over quantity so the Quran is a book of it's not a book where you know we just read it as many times as possible in our lives you know we don't understand it and we don't you know and the only thing we know about it is that every half every letter gives us 10 rewards this is the this is not the purpose of the book yes this is a night this is a reward this is a consequential reward of the book but the purpose of the Quran as the Quran itself says at the very beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah which is the second surah the second chapter of the Quran it is a guidance for the pious it is a guidance for those people who so this book it's very very important to, to, to understand this book is a book of guidance and so therefore you need to learn it and you need to um, and so this is why the Quran came over this period so the context of uh, Surah Al-Kahf <clears throat> is um, that this Surah is basically revealed towards the end of the Meccan period um, some some mufassirun, some exegetes, some scholars of the Quran say that the Meccan period was divided into four periods, four stages. Uh, Maulana Maudui says this. He says that the Meccan period was divided into four stages, and he says that Surah Al-Kahf was revealed in the third stage. <clears throat> and each stage for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gets more difficult. This is a stage where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his companions especially his companions are being physically abused now they're being often manhandled often uh, tortured like Bilal al-Habashi who was basically play, placed with his back uh, uncovered uh, on the midday, in the midday heat on the burning um, uh, sand on the, bur on the burning desert right? and, and, and his obviously we know how hot it can be 70 to 80 degrees C in the, on, on the sand and his skin would basically, you know, um, obviously, you know, start to melt, etc. And Ammar ibn, uh, um, the father of Ammar, Ammar himself, Sumayya and Yasir. Um, these were the things that were happening at that time. And also at that time, what was happening is that the Muslim community had become boycotted. They were ousted into one of the um, kind of uh, uh, valleys of Mecca, just on the outskirts of Mecca. And they were uh, boycotted for three years. And one of them says, one of the uh, people who were, one of the companions of the Prophet wasallam, said that later, he said that we became so hungry that we used to eat grass, that we used to eat, um, you know, uh, skins of animals and we used to find skins of animals, we used to cook that skin and we used to eat it. So this is the kind of the, 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 the uh, stage uh, that, that this surah comes in. Um, some books mention that there were three uh, questions that were posed to the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam and this is why this surah was revealed one of those questions was who was who were the people of the cave who was uh, who were Musa and Khidr and who were who was Dhul Qarnayn and they say that this surah came down to answer these questions inshallah I might mention a bit more about this next time um, the symbolism of this story um, like Surah Yusuf and Surah Isra, Surah Isra is the verse, is Surah 17, Surah Yusuf is Surah 12, and others around this time, is that soon, the, the symbolism is, is that soon the Meccan people and the tribe of the Prophet wasallam are going to make life very difficult for the Prophet wasallam. You'll be persecuted, so find a cave. So find a cave. This is what the symbolism of this story is so the, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to the Prophet sallam, make effort to find a cave wherever you can protect your religion do that and so what we know is that soon after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa does find a cave and that cave is the cave of Medina he migrates to Medina so one of the teachings of this uh, surah is that when you become content with that cave when you become content with what Allah, with what space Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you then you will get the kingdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is one of the uh, symbols uh, uh, or symbolisms of this story the story begins with the people of the cave 
a people who are ousted, who are persecuted, who have to leave that people. And it ends with the story of Dhul Qarnayn, who was a ruler of East and West. And he goes to the end of the world in the East and the end of the world in the West. That was, that's what he does. So this is one of the symbolisms of the story that you, O Muhammad, it's hinting at the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ, the migration. And this is actually what Surah Isra, um, Surah Yusuf that we studied last year, and many other surahs around this time that were revealed, they are hinting at the Prophet ﷺ and also the tribe of the Prophet ﷺ that soon the Prophet will leave and he will leave you and soon he will find a cave, he will find a people that will shelter him and he will become like Yusuf السلام, and he will then become victorious. So this is the symbolism of...